So, in a nutshell, using social media for good. Um, so, just a little bit about me. Um, I should have put it in the bio. I am a Black and disabled woman. Uh, I completed my PhD in geography last year in May. Started as an assistant professor in the health policy in May and C in July. Um, generally, my work is on the intersection between health and healthcare inequity. Um, I'm interested in social, political, and environmental influences on health and how they intersect with inequities in care. And uh, I have been on avid social media since at least 2006, uh, maybe even before, and I joined Twitter in 2008. So I like to say, and I have a slide, I'm not in the business of giving advice, just uh, guidance. But these aren't hard and fast rules, but when the question I always ask myself when I do engage on social media is, why am I using social media? Why, what is this, the purpose of this platform, this outlet? And from that, when you, how you, however you answer that question, the how follows. Um, so when, when I, before I tweet, I ask myself, or at least try, um, does this need to be said? Is this the right audience for this message? And if not, or if it isn't quite the right audience, how do I translate that message to maximize shared understanding? Um, and there's another, one of the pitfalls of social media is that it's easy to assume that relative proximity with a social network on a certain platform is the same as intimacy. But we have to understand it's not at all the same. And I would say, that there's definitely a racial and gender dimension to that assumption that proximity is the same as intimacy. Um, as a black woman, I get a lot of people DMing me their confession. It, it, they, it, it, it's like there's this whole confessional dynamic in, in like anti-racist spaces, DEI spaces, where they feel like they can unload their stuff on the black person and that makes them a better person. Um, it's not. So it's not true. And I've had to set pretty hard boundaries. Uh, like, don't DM me. Like, if you have something to deal with, if you have some wrong to fix or redress, address that with the person you've actually harmed, you don't, but don't put it on other people. And that's just a general thing. But there, there is a general expectation that Black women are always accessible to others to meet their emotional needs. And I'm just gonna say straight up, you do not owe that. You, you do not owe people that. You have to be very clear about your boundaries, very clear about why you're in that space. Um, so again, I'm not in the business of giving advice, so take it with a grain of salt. Um, and so this is kind of best practices for Twitter because it is the primary social media outlet that I use in a public facing like capacity. Um, conveying trustworthiness. If possible, let your username be your name or something that makes it clear that you are a person. And um, I would advise of avoiding putting your current institutional affiliation in your username because if you're an academic or if you're a PhD student, you may, you may well move or change, go to another institution. But also, um, you would have to be very, very clear that when you tweet, you're speaking for yourself. Um, and uh, another thing, having a profile picture with your name, uh, with your picture, like, so that people know you're a human being always helps. And a, a bio that gives context for your tweets because sometimes, especially as a person of color, black person, disabled person, whatever intersections of marginality that you kind of straddle, people will definitely presume, presume incompetence. So if you do want to avoid having to deal with those that those presumptions of interest uh those presumptions of incompetence it helps to have context in your bio not everybody reads for context but it does help um when people do um 
in terms of trustworthiness and engagement on social media too, being is really, really key um, and being kind. It, if you have a reputation for being a kind person, that goes a long way. Um, and one fact, one rule I always hold to as much as I can is when you quote someone else's work, always cite the source. I miss, miss, um, miss spelled source, but always cite the source. Um, if you can, if you can have the quote and the link to the source in the same thing, that helps because Twitter is a medium that you can contextualize individual tweets, but most people will only ever engage with one tweet. So you want to craft your message as though they will only ever see a standalone tweet, even if that tweet is in a is part of a broader thread. So that's that's one of the challenges. That's something that it takes practice. Crafting these short messages that are 280 characters or less that stand alone, but also fit within your broader narrative. Um, and when you are quoting other people's work, making clear that you are quoting someone else's work and those aren't your own words. It's just good practice. Uh, good practice as a scholar, good practice as an advocate. Um, other considerations. Um, it's a, about a couple of years ago, Twitter released the quote tweet function, which allows you to layer your tweet onto something, uh, another tweet someone else's or your own. The thing is, it's often used in a very antagonistic way. Um, so if you do quote tweet, I would recommend trying to keep the tone as positive as possible. So a lot of times when I quote tweet, it's because I have a pull quote from the, the article linked in the tweet that I'm quote tweeting. Or someone else, someone is sharing happy news, like a, a publication, new job, some personal milestone, and I want to celebrate them. Just, try, like, just trying to boost. So that's just like also keeping that balance between positive engagement with your kind of community or network on that platform, but also also being very careful about how you use these functionalities on this website because this. We have to understand too that Twitter, it relies on a model where antagonism drives engagement. And you have to subvert that model. So that means that may actually mean going against some of the best practices for making a tweet go viral. Um, so there's sort of an ethical dilemma where success on social media doesn't necessarily look at success successfully connecting with people in a way that is ethical, right? Um, so with quote tweets, I would say, again, keep it on positive, avoid dunking on or punching down on other people, uh, especially if when people, those people have fewer followers than you. Um, that's just, just part of that is, again, because Twitter, the whole model is based on um, antagonism that drives engagement and it, clicks are what counts for Twitter. Um, so yeah, uh, and this is definitely true, something I've observed over the years. The more followers you have, the more likely it is that the people who respond to the people who, uh, who are responding to you uh, or who maybe quote tweet something you say, there's, there's, more, there's just generally more followers mean more possibility of harassment for yourself and people who follow you or who respond to you. So. It, it falls on you and the people you engage with to curate your feed and also model modes of engagement that are not that counter harassment. Um, another consideration is if you can seek permission before tagging people on posts, um, don't, don't assume that just because someone's on, on Twitter that they want to be tagged on posts. Um, and this, I would say this is especially true for women of color who have experienced a lot more harassment than other groups. Um, and going back to my earlier point, cultivate, if you can, as best as you can, cultivate an ethic of care in how you engage with others and model that. So don't, necessarily, don't, don't encourage people to dunk on, on someone on your behalf. 
Um, I know that's something that people like to do. It's you, it's kind of a holdover from other social media platforms, but definitely try to avoid that kind of behavior. Um, I just, it doesn't bode very well um, for anyone involved as far as I'm concerned. Um, so my own experience, I rejoined Twitter in 2017 um, as a PhD student to a live tweet a conference. And um, I was very intentional. I decided from the outset that my Twitter use would be public facing. And I decided to scale back on personal uh, posts um, because I noticed that the presumption of privacy is long gone. There, we, we have to start from the assumption that there is no privacy on, privacy on social media and move accordingly. And because I was establishing myself as credible, um, I was always intentional about backing up my assertions with sources. And I would say again, there's a gender and racial uh, dimension there where there's a presumption of incompetence and whiteness itself is treated as a proxy for uh, uh, objectivity and authority. Um, and I know this is somewhat of a defensive posture, but it is necessary because that's what we're dealing with. Um, and I would say overall, Twitter is a great way to share your thought process. Um, and back to the point about quote tweeting, quote tweeting yourself is a really great way to nest previous threads and give more context to that 200, 280 characters. Um, and also enable context cues to reduce misunderstanding. Um, so like get, going back to that point where I said about how about tweets generally being engaged in as standalone units. Um, so crafting messages as standalone units, you can do that better if you nest the thread, nest a tweet under a tweet. Um, and kind of uh, just, just like another from the same thread, but just kind of ex you can expand on your thoughts if you do thread your tweets too. Um, experience, um, when I did rejoin Twitter in 2017, I was in the middle of writing my dissertation. So I started sharing my reading and that actually became part of my workflow and it was incidentally a really great way to connect with scholars who are doing the work I was, that I was, who were, whose work I was actually engaging. Am I getting cutting up to, up to time? Uh, I, I, you're fine. Keep going. This is great. Okay. This is great. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, and I would say, try to keep, again, try to keep it on positive. I, I don't mean that in a, like a toxic positivity sense, but try to keep the positive tone in a more generative sense where you're showing what you want to see in the world. So for related to that, I'm not in the habit of putting takedowns of studies or, you know, taking apart, picking apart the methods of studies that may, you know, touch on a topic that I'm, I'm an expert on. I specifically avoid doing that on Twitter um, because it, I know it's a popular thing to do on academic Twitter, but it very rarely results in any actual, well, change, you know? I have seen a few articles withdrawn from journals and so forth, retracted, but I haven't seen as much I think it, it's much better if you provide, if you can provide examples of things that are done right. Um, okay. Yes, and yeah, so recently I was invited to take over the Twitter account for the Society for Epidemiologic Research. And so I tweeted about, and this is getting out a little bit about what I think the positionality. So I started with a positionality statement and that actually contextualized this thread about um, the history. It was a very brief thread about the history of research on health disparities or health inequities in Black communities and different approaches like qualitative, quantitative approaches. And I, I ended it with some reading recommendations. But like it's it's a very different model than what you see from a lot of in a lot of academic Twitter, but you, you I'm not saying you have to do this, but I'm saying you figure out what works for you. Uh, so that's it for me. Uh, so hopefully that gives everybody time for questions.